folks. It is great to be here at, uh, from what I've been able to discern, a small amount of time is uh, sort of the crystal Pepsi of TED Talks. Is that right? <laughs> um, I, I am here because, <laughs> yeah, that's, they're going to get me for that one. Uh, <laughs> I'm here because I'm a zealot. I believe in my heart of hearts, I'm standing in front of you today making this promise that we can predict the future. There's been this, this idea for decades that we can predict and prevent the next pandemic and we have spent billions of taxpayer dollars on that. And now we're in this weird lurch, right? Where after COVID, we're trying to deliver on that promise, we're trying to continue that work. But at the same time, there are people who very earnestly think that this is a waste of money. There are people who very earnestly think that we cannot predict the future. And I, I have no patience for this debate. I think it is absolutely swallowing my field. I am not interested in talking about, in theoretical terms, what is possible or not. I just wanna try to do it. And that's what my team does. So I wanna stand in front of you today and tell you why I think we can predict the future. You'll hear from Dylan after me. And Dylan and myself and anyone who's ever responded to an outbreak, has one enemy, and that enemy is free will. At least in a predictive sense, right? If you want to predict the future, the hardest thing you are going up against at any moment in time is human behavior. It is the thing that makes epidemics complicated. It is the thing that makes society and climate change and all of the big issues we're talking about here complicated. But there is a scale of the universe at which that is not a problem. And my team and I work at that scale, at the level where a virus interacts with a host. Everything is physics and chemistry. There are rules, it is elegant and simple, and it is the only place I find order in the universe. And if we get really good at understanding that, maybe we can teach a computer to do it. And that's what we're working on. We are trying to teach a computer to be an okay virologist. Now, we're halfway between an academic institute and a startup. And that means that we can kind of take the best out of both worlds. If you were Meta or Google, and you're trying to predict social networks, you start by building a database. And that's what we did. We built a social network for all of the hosts and viruses in the world, every animal and every virus that has ever interacted. And then we teach a computer the rules. And that lets us do things like predict a year in advance that this incredibly poorly lit hog, uh, not hog badger, what is this, ferret badger, you gotta know your badgers. Might have been the animal that helped SARS-CoV-2 jump from bats to humans in Huanan Market, right? This is a tool that actually works in outbreak investigations because there are rules. Now, if we can do that, we can use the same exact algorithms to find viruses that look like they can infect humans. And we've done this. We've trained these models and we can go into the world and find evidence for each of these viruses that they have started to make the jump into humans. That means we can look for them in wastewater. It means we can start developing vaccines and therapeutics. It means we know what we are up against if we are trying to prevent the next pandemic. I'm tired of talking about whether we can predict. We've done it. Preventing is the hard part. COVID shows us how hard it is to actually harness outbreak response. I'll tell you a secret, Dylan has a much harder job than I do. <laughs> There's a really big idea right now that maybe if, if the human side is the hard part, maybe we can rely on conservation. Maybe we can go further upstream and we can work on wildlife trade or deforestation or agriculture. These three things that are collectively pushing pathogens out of nature and into humans. But there's a problem with this. All of these are, are factors that have been involved in pandemics in the last century, but pandemics are terrible data. Let me give you an example, flu, right? Flu is our, our big bad. It's always the thing waiting in the wings. There have been four flu pandemics that started in agriculture since 1900. Do we think that we should design the future of food systems around four data points? So we need to go deeper, we need to go broader, we need more data, we need causal inference, and that's what we've done. The last time someone tried to do a study like this, they had 147 data points. We spent the last couple of years putting together nearly 100,000. This is every record a scientist has ever seen of an emerging disease jumping 
from animals to humans. And what we can use this to do is ask across systems, across continents, what is at the steering wheel? And it's not climate, and it's not deforestation, and it's not bushmeat hunting, it's not mining, it's not any of those things that matter in each of those stories that we're so used to. The universal fingerprint is healthcare. We see spillover where sick people can go to the doctor. That creates a problem for us. I think as Americans, it's very easy to forget that we are physically surrounded by healthcare. Not necessarily good healthcare, not necessarily healthcare you can afford, but it's there. There are hospitals in walking distance of everywhere here. Some of them even treat you. Um, <laughs> the rest of the world doesn't have that luxury, and that becomes a really tangible problem when it comes to outbreak detection. And it is a much bigger problem than you think, I promise. And I want to tell you the one fact that always haunts me in this space. In 2019, researchers at Cambridge noticed something weird. Ebola outbreaks are all just a little bit too large. See, outbreaks have a natural sort of rhythm to them. There are small outbreaks, there are big outbreaks, but we're missing all of the small outbreaks because it takes us a while to spot them, and some of them we don't spot at all. And so they went and they did the math and they found half of all Ebola outbreaks probably go undetected. That is what we're up against with healthcare systems. And if you think that we're missing half of Ebola outbreaks, think about all of the respiratory diseases. Think about the next Zika, right? We're not gonna catch any of those. This is a problem for us because we focused all of the ways that we think about prevention on conservation. We focused on sort of overcorrecting from a health system lens to a conservation lens, and we've lost the common thread. But I wanna tell you a radical idea. I don't think conservation is upstream of health. And I want to show you what I mean. This is what we currently think about in a conservation setting in terms of what we could spend on healthcare. Healthcare estimates actually put the number that we need 50 times higher. And that seems like a lot of money to have to try to choose. Do we spend it on conservation? Do we spend it on health? But I think they're the same issue. In 2007, a nonprofit called Health and Harmony went into rural communities in Indonesia. And they said, what do you need to stop doing illegal logging? And they spent 400 hours in dialogue with these communities. And they made a gamble. Communities said, we can stop illegal logging if we have access to affordable, quality health care. So they built a clinic at the edge of a national park. And 10 years later, illegal logging in those communities is almost entirely gone. We have to stop thinking of ecology as upstream of health. These things are complicated, they are interconnected, they are multi-directional, it is a cycle. We need to stop spillover, we need to prevent pandemics, we need to prepare for the pandemics that slip through the cracks. And right now, there's a treaty being negotiated that could do all of that. This is the moment, right? And I, I look at this, and, and again, all of the discourse about the pandemic treaty is about whether it's gonna work. And there are people who say it's, it's too weak, it's, it's too diffuse. Something like this can't possibly solve these problems. But I, I come back to the same thing as prediction. Why not try? Right. So that's what we're doing. We're giving it a God's honest effort. Thanks, folks. <laughs>